So hey, we are in the series called Love Like Jesus, and one of the things that we have been thinking about is that Jesus is really not a judger. And I love that our church has become and is becoming a place where it's judgment-free. Like, we had a sign out that said, this is the judgment-free zone, right? So, with that in mind, I want to take a poll today, uh, a judgment-free poll, (laughs) hopefully. So, you have to be honest, okay? So, by a show of hands, who here takes a shower every day? Like, oh, yeah, we have some clean people. I love this. How many people don't take a shower every day but wish they could take a shower every day? Is that anybody? Yeah, okay, thank you, Ivan, very good. How many people are just really lucky and they have this, like, fresh, clean baby smell that comes from them even if they don't shower every day? (laughs) Danny, whoa, that's so great. I wish I was as lucky as you. Oh, man. Well, thank you for being honest about that. That's good. So, I love showers. This is why I have to know, right? I'm not judging your hygiene practices. I just really love showers. And I have been talking to a lot of my friends who are moms lately, and (laughs) the moms are already laughing because they know where I'm going with this, right? Um, They said, you know, it's kind of impossible when you are raising little kids to take a shower. Like, It doesn't happen every day, maybe not even every two days. And if you do get a shower, it's like one of those 90-second crazy scrub downs, and then you gotta jump back out to make sure that your kids aren't killing each other or burning the house down or something like that, right? It's not this like luxurious, satisfying, like, oh, I just love my shower moment. And that is what I am used to. So as uh, Amos and I are anticipating our baby to come in April, I have been thinking, like, oh, man, I have to give up my shower schedule. And this is really hard for me. Um, I know, I know. It's just, like, adjustments, right? You're, you're laughing because you're like, that's the least of your worries. I know, <laughs> I know. Oh, but I was reflecting on uh, a time when I just craved a shower. And I was a senior in high school, and my youth leadership group at church took this week-long adventure hiking trip to the Colorado Rockies. And it was for the purposes of like leadership development and bonding and just doing something really hard and gritty together. Um, it's probably one of the favorite experiences I've ever had in my life, to be honest. Um, but, you know, so we... We start off, and we're whitewater rafting in the Arkansas River, and then after that, we go to this base camp, and they teach you how to pack your pots and your pans and your tent and your food, and like, legit, we are carrying all of this on our shoulders up the mountain. So we pack it, and off we go into a five-day excursion up the mountain to our summit, which is this ridge in the Continental Divide. So needless to say, we are filthy, right? We're dirty, um, not just because we're like sweaty and you're like, we trudged through some snow that was up to my waist. It was crazy hard. Probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. And so you're just grimy and you're not showering and you're sleeping on the rocks in your tent overnight. But one of the reasons it was particularly gross is because the park, rightly so, had Uh, a policy of, like, carry in, carry out, leave no waste. Leave no trace, leave no waste, right? You you know this. So that's fine if you're doing, like, a two-hour hike or a day hike, but not so cool if you're there for a week. So you know where I'm going with this. Not only can we not have, like, paper products, that includes toilet paper. And actually, now that I think about that, I don't know if our youth leaders were just trying to like punk us and just make us do something that sounds crazy hard, because, come on, a little toilet paper shouldn't hurt, but no toilet paper. So all we had was this tiny little garden tool that kind of looked like a little, like a little hoe, like a little spade thing that you dig in the dirt with, and we fondly named it the Biff Stick. And we put it between the guys' tents and the girls' tents. And so when you had to go to the bathroom, I know, this is so gross. I I promise it does relate. Um, 
it, when you have to go to the bathroom, you, you get the Biff stick so like everybody knows that you're out doing your business, and you have to dig a hole and try to hit it and then cover it up. Okay. So we decided to have fun with this, and we thought, we're going to have a toileting competition, of course. And I know, it's so awesome, because I still remember, like, you got points for if you were going to the bathroom and you saw some wildlife, but then you got double points if the, the animal was actually dropping a load while you were dropping a load. <laughs> and so anyway, this point system was crazy elaborate. And um, this, the boys probably came up with this, right? Like, I don't know what high school girls are thinking, like, let's make this bathroom competition. Um, but you also got points for like the most creative wiping item, which we learned was uh, pine cones, in case you're ever in this. <laughs> I know, a little scratchy, but pine cones and snow. Those are the best things that we could find. So if you're ever like in the wilderness, try those things out, <laughs> right? So needless to say, like I craved a shower. I mean, I tried to get clean all week, like through the little streams, you know, you're like, okay, let's splash some water in my face, try to wash my hands. But you don't really actually feel clean. You're like, I just need a shower, right? So when I got down, back down the mountain, to, back to base camp, I like don't have words for this experience. I saw the shower house and I was just like, oh, I've never been so satisfied and happy in my life and I'm anticipating how wonderful this is gonna be just to like, ah, oh, it's just raining down on me. And I legit think we all took 45-minute showers, and, which was awesome, and our youth leaders were so good because they're like, sure, we don't care, we just don't want to smell you in the van on the ride back, right? So they just let us take the shower. Okay, so what does all this have to do <laughs> with Jesus? Well, truly there is something so amazing about that desire or that need to be cleansed by water but i think more important than that more even human than that is the need to drink it to quench our thirst with water and so today we're gonna look at a passage in the bible that's all about being thirsty so if you have your bibles you can turn to john 7 chapter 37 with me or your devices, or it'll be up on the screen for you. And I'm just going to read out of the New Living Translation here. It says, On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not been given yet because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. So the context is this. The Jews are gathering for something called the Feast of the Tabernacle. And this was their way to sort of ceremonially remind themselves of how God had provided for them when they were in the desert. So they were in slavery in Egypt, and then he released them, but now they're wandering around in the desert. And so there's a lot of eating at this festival, there's drinking, there's revelry, there's celebration, there's lots of joyous noise. And there are these two really interesting rituals that happen. The first is that the people would actually create these lean-tos or tents, and they would sleep in them. And that was to remind themselves, like, God made a shelter for me, and he took care of my physical needs when I was in the desert. And the other thing that would happen is that the priests who were here at the festival would, every day, for seven days, carry um, a special container, like a goblet, and they would go to this really specific pool, and they would fill it with water, and then they would like have this processional where they would bring it back to the temple and then they would dump it out on the altar. And that was to remind them how God provided water for them in the desert by striking the rock and then the spring came out of the rock. Okay, you following me? It's a crazy story. So imagine Jesus shows up at this festival on the very last day and 
there are crowds shouting and there's all this stuff happening. And now keep in mind, in the passage right before this in the Bible, it says that there are some men who are literally hunting him down to kill him. They want to arrest him because he's claiming that he's God. So you would think, like, okay, Jesus should probably keep a low profile. He can go to the festival, but why is, he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. So what he does in this passage is so shocking because he shouts, right, mostly just to be heard above the crazy noise of the crowd, but also I think because he has this prophetic message, this prophetic proclamation, and he says, come to me. Anybody who's thirsty can come to me. Anybody who believes in me can come and drink. And that, like I said, this is not a lecture-style announcement, right? He's not like, climb up on my podium and tell everyone, hey, here's the plan. It's like welling up in his heart out of his great love that's compelling him to risk exposure to come and bring this message to people. And he says, anyone can come to me. The only criteria is that you have to be thirsty. So we can hardly grasp the magnitude of what this really means, right, without kind of understanding the historical context and what was happening in the Old Testament. So I'm going to put that verse back up on the screen. You probably noticed this is a funny kind of inclusion in this story. It's actually in parentheses in my Bible. But it says, when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. So that's kind of confusing, right? Spirit's here, he's not, he's given, what's happening? And what you notice here is that word given. So in the Old Testament, pre-Jesus, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit were the same thing. But that presence, would it could come and rest on people. It could um, be shown on objects, right? You might say, I see, you see Moses um, sees the presence of God in a burning bush, or he's in a pillar of salt, or he shows up like fire. We hear all these kind of strange references for, okay, where's God's spirit? And he takes on these funny appearances. But people couldn't see him face to face. You could go to the temple, but you had to stay on the outskirts and experience God that way. You couldn't go into the inner space because his face was too holy. So that's what it means here when they say it hasn't been given yet. It's, it's, ha- it's active. We see him move. We can notice him, but it's not given to us yet because Jesus hadn't, been, he hadn't gone into his glory, and glory here means death. He hadn't died yet. Right, So Jesus has to die, and then he says, hey, you're getting somebody better. You're getting my spirit, and he comes to stay with you. So back in the wilderness, the Israelites are growing really, really thirsty. Like so thirsty, so desperate, that they just need a drink of water to sustain their life. And so human nature kicks in, and they rebel in their thirst. They think, you know, God, we don't like the way you're managing our life. This is dumb. I'm out here, I'm parched, I'm exhausted, and you don't even give us anything to drink. So what do they decide to do? They want to kill Moses, which actually makes no sense, right? But this is what we do. So God says, hey, Moses, this is what you should do. Go take some leaders who are with you, go up to this place that I'm going to show you where this big rock is, and take a rod, and then I'm going to bring my presence on this rock, and then, this is super strange, right? And he says, then you're going to take the rod, this big stick that I told you to bring up there, and you're going to start hitting the rock with the stick, which just sounds ridiculous, right? But that is how the miracle happens. The rock is struck, and there is this fountain, this geyser of water, and the people are able to drink. See, God quenches their thirst with this most unlikely source, and that is what they're celebrating at this feast. 
And then Jesus interrupts them with this crazy invitation. And he says, come to me and have a drink. And isn't that funny? He doesn't say, go and get a drink. Right? He doesn't say, like, okay, here's a treasure map. You have to do it all Indiana Jones style. Find the clues. You know, if you're good enough to survive out there while you're searching for this water, then you'll get it. No, he says, come to me. It's an invitation. So I just have been marveling at this as I've looked at this the past few days, and I just want to share a couple of things I've noticed. We already said it's an invitation, but he says anyone can come. And actually, that sounds a lot like Jesus' love is wide, right? We've already talked about this in that series. But what he's referencing here is actually a passage in Isaiah. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible, but Isaiah's a prophet, and he's trying to foretell or tell in advance what the kingdom of God is like. And Isaiah 55 says, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat good food. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you, what does he give him? All the unfailing love I promised David. It's a super beautiful passage, and Jesus is alluding to this when he stands up at this festival, and he says, anyone can come to me and get a drink. The only criteria is that you are thirsty, right? To receive God, this is crazy, to receive God, the God of the universe, the God who made you, the God who loves you. All you have to be is thirsty. Think about it, it's not how much money you have, it's not your social status, it's not how worthy your family tells you what you are of love. Thirst is like one of the most basic human needs. Why? Because it comes to us every single day, right? You can't actually go a day without drinking. I mean, you can, uh, but you don't live very long, right? And then the other thing that's so crazy is he says, come to me. So he's got this invitation, but not only is he saying, you can quench your thirst, he's saying, I am the one. I am the one who will quench your thirst. He says, I can satisfy you in your innermost being. And I think something he wants to say to us today is that if you don't even know what you want yet, it's Jesus. Like, he's always the one you're looking for. So, in in this passage, he says, you're not thirsty if you're filling up on food that doesn't give you strength. You're not thirsty if you're trying to eat junk food. Like, you're you're satisfying yourself so you don't feel the actual hunger and thirst you have because it's just kind of in the way. So some of you might be here wondering, like, why am I here? Like, maybe, maybe like, actually, existentially, like, why do I exist? Why am I on the earth, right? But, but, like, why am I in a church building right now? Why am I sitting here on these seats listening to this person talk? What are you looking for? What is it that you really want? Is it purpose, meaning, connection, security, safety, better friends, love? If that is you and you're thinking, man, I do not have my ducks in a row, that's okay. That's actually just your thirst welling up. That's your thirst talking to you. And I think what God wants you to know today is that the thing that you think you need 
actually just points to the thing you really do need. You guys, you can live a benevolent and moral life and it won't satisfy your thirst. It won't quench you. You can try to be satisfied by everything else, but it won't actually work. Because Jesus says, it's me. It's me. You know, in coming to Jesus, too, we have to make personal contact with him. Right? So last week, we heard about how Jesus reaches out and he touches the leper. And that's how he is made, the leper is made clean. That's how he's healed. So just like that, water, right? Like you can touch it, but you actually have to ingest it for it to do anything. You have to take it into your physical body. And that's where the nourishment comes from. That's where the refreshing comes from. And I think Jesus is saying that. If you drink of me, right? He says, it produces a spring of water in you. Which is super crazy to think about. Guys, we are thirsty people. And I don't think I realize this, but when you're thirsty, you have to admit an absence of something. You have to admit that you're empty, that there's a need that you have that's not being met, right? Little kids are great at this. Mom, can I have a drink? Dad, can I have a drink? I need a drink. I actually need a drink right now, so I'm going to have some Gatorade, (laughs) which I'll tell you more about in a minute. Right? It's this simple and beautiful invitation, but it's actually not easy to admit that we're thirsty because our pride gets in the way. I was reading back through some of my old journals um, a couple days ago, And I was just struck because I saw this pattern of me like, Jesus, here's all of the stuff that's a mess in my life right now, right? Like, here's all my inner turmoil. My schedule's falling apart. My house is a mess. My family's upset with me. I don't know if I'm making good decisions with my life, with my time, with my money. Like, what is going on? I'm trying to keep it together. And in that, I I actually am like living this life that feels more like dying than living. I I just see the pattern over and over. And then one of the pages just jumped out at me, and I remember, I'd like, I went back to that moment, and I had sat before Jesus, and these lyrics, these song lyrics just kind of washed over me. And the lyrics were, though the earth may try to satisfy my heart, Though the earth may try to tell me you're not faithful. Though the earth may try to blind me from your goodness, you shine through. You shine through. You shine through. And then the chorus is, you're the only one that can fill me up. You're the only one that can fill me up. And you know what happens when you sit in that space and you just are like, that is true. I just want to believe that that's true. Help me believe that that's true is that God actually came and he said, yeah, Allison, like, you're a mess. And it doesn't matter how parched or crispy or crunchy you are. Like, I am always green. That's what he said. He said, I'm always green and I'm always full of life. No matter how withered and crunchy we are, guys, Jesus' love is satisfying because it's this internal, ongoing reality that is working itself out in our lives, in our very beings. I don't think it's an accident that all over the Bible there are examples and illustrations of thirst and water. Right? We, we read about it, water cleans you, it refreshes you, it nourishes you, it grows things. God loves talking about trees and and life and vitality, and he's always saying there's water that's the source of that all. I think Jesus uses water and thirst because he's trying to tell us, hey, your deepest needs are not just a one and done. Like, you can't get them met once and then move on. You have to, like, get your deepest needs met every single day. You can't just drink a bunch of water. I don't know if anyone's tried. You can't just drink a bunch of water one day and then try to, like, I'm not going to drink for the next week. It doesn't work like that. 
You can't bank up the needs that you have and be like, God's going to do it all over here, and then I'm going to try to like home stretch it. It doesn't work. And you can't just use any liquid. So this is actually really comical because I didn't realize that I brought this Gatorade up here. Well, I did, but I'm learning a lot about this in pregnancy, right? Because I want things with flavor. So every morning I'm like, I need something sour or sweet or something. I just can't do plain water. It's so gross. So I drink lemonade or I go to the Gatorade, which is so funny because this is what I'm drinking now, right? I go to the Gatorade. I take a sip. It's pretty good. But... Here's what you realize later. All the sugar and all the salt in those drinks actually make you more thirsty, right? Do you guys do this? It's so dumb. Like, I learned it, I learned it yesterday the hard way, and then I was like, oh, what I really want is water. And then today, what did I bring up here? Gatorade. I didn't even do it for an illustration. I just went to the fridge and brought this, because that's what I wanted. It's hysterical. Like, we forget so much. We need water. Come to Jesus, even in your driest, most parched state. I think it's only when we let him love us this way, when we're dry, when we're weary, when we're in the desert, that this concept of God's love actually stops being a concept and becomes this thirst-quenching reality that we live in. It's a process, though. It happens as the Holy Spirit in us does his work. And what I've realized is, like, when I let Jesus, when I just come to him, and I I say, like, I'm bankrupt, I have nothing, I'm so dry, I'm so tired, I'm so weary, the Holy Spirit always shines the spotlight on Jesus. He always illuminates who Jesus is, and then that invitation comes back to me. Come to me, drink, it's good, it's for your good. And then I do, I I have these moments where like my soul is so overwhelmed by the love of God that all the rejection around me falls off. And, And I have these moments where His love is so real to me that it doesn't matter what other people are saying, I still feel loved. And then, just as easy, right? I have this long season of being really satisfied in the love of God. I forget. Something happens, life gets hard. You know, God feels distant. And, and to be quite honest, like, loving people just feels really pointless. So I'm like, well, I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to get burned. Like, why do I do this? But that cycle of forgetting over and over again, well, it just drives you mad until you relax and you realize, like, I'm empty. I'm thirsty. I just need to be reminded of this invitation to come back and drink. So what does this look like practically? I'm sure some of you are wondering. So I would say spiritual practices really can be anything we do to spend time with God, but really what they are is they're they're designed to help us notice and then quench our thirst for God. So I, I notice it. I have to sit in the reality that I'm not okay, that I'm thirsty, They do that very well. And then God doesn't just leave us high and dry. There's a way that he meets that thirst. And I will say it again. This really can be anything you do to spend time with God. So don't make it too hard. Don't beat yourself up. If you're really, really um, needing something that's refreshing, don't think of the hardest way, you know, the most like spiritual thing you could do to try to get back in the love of God, because it'll just frustrate you, right? Think about what do you do when you want to have a good, growing, healthy relationship with people? Well, you start there, right? You, you say, I'm going to be a part of a community that loves me. That's what this church is trying to be for each other, right? We are a body, a community of people who are trying to just love each other. It's a great practice. 
You know, prayer, having a conversation with God. Same thing, if you want to get to know somebody, you've got to talk to them. Reading and meditating on the Bible, singing songs of love to Jesus or songs of lament and grief. You can do that too. This week I thought about also like these spiritual practices, these rhythms. It's a little bit like learning to swim, right? So if you've ever taught your child to swim or you remember being taught to swim, we all, you're like little babies, you watch them, you've got to like get them used to the water, right? So you dip their toes in and you splash them and they're like, ah, I don't know if I like this very much. And then you move to this place where, okay, the water's okay, but I still need a lot of support, right? So in the spiritual life, it's like, okay, I dip my toe in, I do five minutes of reading my Bible or five minutes of prayer. And then you move to this place where you're like, how do I live this thing out? Like, I have questions. I need to know, what does it look like to make decisions and follow Jesus? What does this Bible passage mean, right? We, we have to have the support of other people to try to get those questions answered. And then you're off to the races, and you're like, I'm perfecting my freestyle and my backstroke, and I'm doing so good, and I'm loving this. Everything's cool, got good rhythms going on. But then what happens? If you're a swimmer, you realize like, you get tired. You can't actually keep going. You just run out of energy. Your arms feel like lead, and you're like, oh, no, I'm stuck. And you can't, like, if you stop, what's going to happen? You're going to sink right? Or you can float. And floating is this new kind of experience that I feel like I'm just moving into in the last couple of years. Like, what does it look like to float in the love of God, to actually cease my motion, stop the effort, stop the flailing, stop the trying to make forward progress, and just like, just lay back and be held in the love of God. That's amazing. But it's hard to stay there, right? The process will start all over again because inevitably you'll be like, oh man, is there a rock coming? Am I going to go over a waterfall? Is there a cliff? What if there's an alligator? Oh gosh, I better lift my head up, right? All these fears and worries start coming at us and we're like, whoa, we got to steer. Like, what do you mean I'm just floating out here, God? I don't get to control my direction. I don't know. I can't see what's going on. So I lift my head up and I look around. I'm like, oh, where are the hazards? What's happening? Right? And then you got to start flailing around again or you're going to sink. But the invitation is always, come to me. Come back to me. Every morning, you never are going to outgrow these rhythms of needing to connect with Jesus. Here's another cool thing, guys. When you come to Jesus for a drink, he says you yourself actually become a spring of water. So when Jesus puts water in us, it's not stagnant. It's not like a cesspool, like here's some water, hope you can like keep it clean. It's a spring, it has a flow, it's going somewhere, it's going outward even. So we love like Jesus as we become a fountain for other people. So think of those relationships where you just feel so satisfied, where you're like, this is so good, I really, really enjoy this person. I bet it's not, doesn't have anything to do with what you do when you're with them. I bet it's actually more about how you feel when you're with the person. And it doesn't even have to be about how deep your conversation was that day, right? I have this friend, one of the rhythms I've started lately is I paint with my friend. And I try to do this about twice a month, so every other week we get together and we paint. And painting is actually really therapeutic for me. But that is not why I leave there just filled up and just so satisfied and so full. It's just because being in her presence, I'm experiencing this overflow of the life of Jesus, of her coming out onto me. And I have another friend who we just have the longest goodbyes uh, because we're always thinking of like, oh, there's one more really great thing I've got to tell you before I leave. 
And so it just goes on and on. And I will like literally stand in the doorway and 45 minutes later and I'm like still trying to go. And she always laughs at me and she's like, Allison, you know why this is so good? You know why long goodbyes are so good? It's because there's never enough time. Like she had this insight. There's, it feels like there's never enough time with you. But the cool thing is we have heaven. We have eternity. Like we could actually have an eternal conversation, which... The guys are like, that sounds terrible. No more talking, right? But guys, that's what it's like to be loved by Jesus. You never want it to end. (laughs) My husband's laughing at me. You never want it to end. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to. That's the good news today. It doesn't have to. Like, we go on and on and on because Jesus goes on and on and on. And we can be in his love forever. So to wrap up, I just want to say, remember, in the wilderness, God says, it's crazy, I'm going to put my presence on this rock, and I don't think that Moses truly has any concept of what God is asking him to do. Because like I said, it makes no sense. Take this rod and start whacking this big rock, and then something's going to happen. And here's the crazy thing. The rod of God symbolized his punishment, his wrath. So think about that. Jesus is telling, or God is telling Moses, take this thing that symbolizes my wrath and strike me, strike the presence of God with it, and then the life springs forth. What does that sound like to you? Jesus on the cross? Like he was struck to death. And he says, you can't sustain your own life. You can't fix your own problems. You're a mess. You're dry. You're parched. And because I love you and because my love is satisfying to you, I'm going to die in your place and you get the living water. Some of the final words in the Bible, I love this, the water theme is everywhere, guys. The final words in the Bible, Revelation 22, this is John's vision of what it's like when Jesus is going to come back and restore and set all things right. And the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. And to this river, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires, drink freely from the water of life. Thirsty people receive the kingdom of God. 